Grace and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Here in Chicago, if you haven't noticed, there are many huge buses that run up and down the busy streets, especially in downtown. And I think for visitors to the city, aside from the skyscrapers and the, the crowds of people downtown and the, the terrible traffic at rush hour, probably all of those buses barreling down Michigan Avenue and other parts of downtown are, are one of the first things that visitors to the city probably notice about our city. What makes those huge machines run up and down the streets the way they do? Most of us probably know that there's a big engine inside of those buses. And that engine is run by creating perfectly timed little explosions, which make the pistons of the engine pump up and down, which makes the drive shaft spin, which makes the, the wheels spin, which in turn propels that huge lumbering machine down the street. Today I'd like you to consider a question. Where does your power come from? Well, just like a bus or any other vehicle or machine that moves, power, also for our Christian living, has to come from somewhere. As we consider this reading from God's Word before us in the letter to the Hebrews today, we'll ask and then answer that question, where does our power come from, our power for Christian living? We'll see that on our own, we are powerless, but that God's love empowers us. Now, as we think about the buses out on the street, each one of those buses has its own designated route to follow. There are street signs and sometimes uh, paint on the, on the streets itself that give directions for the buses to follow. Similarly, our route through life is also designated by God in the Bible. God gives us specific directions for what we are supposed to do and not do as we go along this designated route through our lives. We have a few examples of those directions from God here in our reading from the letter to the Hebrews. Verse 1 says, Continue to show brotherly love. Verse 2 says, Do not fail to show love to strangers. Verse 3 says, Remember those in prison and those who are mistreated. Verse 4 says, Marriage is to be held in honor by all, and the marriage bed is to be kept undefiled. Verse 5 says, keep your life free from the love of money and be content with what you have. These commands from God, instructions from God, are like signposts on the street that tell drivers where to go, where to yield, where to stop, where they can change lanes or not. All these things are the will of God for our lives, spoken directly to us through the divinely inspired writer of this letter to the Hebrews. These are things that God wants us to do and not to do as we live our lives here on earth. But the critical question for us is where do we get the power to do these things, to follow these instructions from God? Where does our power for Christian living come from? Well, the society that we live in has an answer for us. So often in our society, we, we hear the advice to just look inside yourself. The power for life is within you. You just need to tap into it if you dig down deep enough. And sometimes we might even be tempted to listen to that advice. We hear the words, you can do it. And so we take these commands of God and we try to dig deep within ourselves and muster all of our energy and all of our concentration and focus to do the things that God tells us to do and to reject all of those things that God tells us not to do. And maybe, at least for a time, at least on the outside, we can be pretty successful in following God's commands as we strive to, to dig deep and find power within ourselves. But then what happens? Well, we, we may succeed in following some of the commands of God, but then some temptation arises and it begins to grow in our hearts and, 
It attacks and beats down our resolve. It breaks down all of those defenses that we have put up by our own strength. And then after a while, as our resolve is beaten down, we eventually open our arms and invite the temptation into our hearts and lives. And in so doing, we sin against a command of God. All of that striving and effort by our own power and all our inner resolve to overcome temptation, all of that fails because of the weakness of our own sinful nature. God says in our reading, continue to show brotherly love. But we know that sometimes our hearts are simply full of jealousy, anger, resentment, hatred, contempt. And sometimes those sinful thoughts and attitudes of our hearts also carry over and pour forth in our words and actions. We might say something unkind about another person, perhaps behind that person's back. We may be tempted to get into an argument with someone else, whether a a friend, a family member, a colleague, or even sometimes a complete stranger. And we use our words to lash out at that person and to tear them down. God says, do not fail to show love to strangers. But so often we're so concerned about the things of our own lives and our own affairs that we fail to see the needs even of our closest family members and friends, much less the needs of people that we don't even know or we don't have a connection to. God says, remember those in prison and those who are mistreated. But don't we so often turn our heads and look the other way when we see someone, especially a stranger, who is in need of our help? God says, marriage is to be held in honor by all, and the marriage bed is to be kept undefiled. But so often we permit lustful sexual thoughts to remain in our hearts, and we think about things that are improper. And maybe we even let those thoughts and desires spill over into sinful sexual actions in our lives, and perhaps even into a lifestyle of living against God's institution of marriage. And so by those thoughts and desires and actions, we show that we are actually dishonoring God's institution of marriage. And we commit sexual sins in our hearts. As we look at all of our best efforts, just in these few examples that God gives to us in our reading, we see all of our failings. And so we're reminded that by our own power, it is impossible for us to keep God's commandments in the way that he requires. As we look at our lives and examine our hearts, we see that we are powerless to save ourselves and to live as God commands us to live. And so where does that leave us? Are we crushed and simply left waiting for judgment, for a sentence of eternal damnation in hell without any hope of salvation? When God reveals to us that we are powerless on our own, he also reveals to us where the true power for Christian living comes from. On our own, we are powerless, but God's love empowers us. The Apostle John explains this love of God to us in 1 John chapter 4, verses 9 to 10. He writes, This is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only Son into the world that we might live through him. This is love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his Son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. God's love for us caused God to send his own Son, Jesus, into the world to be born as our brother in the flesh. He truly is Emmanuel which means God with us. He obeyed all of God's commands perfectly, fulfilling God's will in our place in order to cover over all of the many times in our lives that we have failed to do or to think or to say what God commands. And then Jesus took all of our sins upon himself 
and he offered his own life as a sacrifice to pay for the debt of sin that we owed, not only us, but the debt of sin for all the people of the whole world. A debt that we could never hope to repay by ourselves. The punishment that we could never hope to bear by ourselves. But Jesus bore it all for us on the cross. Jesus suffered for us and then he died. He was raised to life again in order to assure us of his victory over death. To give us proof that his love for us is true. His forgiveness for all of our sins is complete. His salvation for us is perfect and final and sure. This is love. It's this love of God that supplies the power that we lack on our own to follow God's will. Where does our power come from for Christian living? It's God's love that empowers us. And so the writer to the Hebrews explains that this love of God is present with us always. He writes, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today and forever. The love that Jesus showed when he died on the cross is the same love that he has for you and me today, right now. It's the same love that he will continue to have for us later today, tomorrow, and the day after that, and every day in our future until we enjoy eternal love and life with him in heaven. Our Savior continues to watch over us, to shelter us, to protect us, to guard us with his love. He continuously assures us, whenever we fail to live up to his standard by our own efforts, he assures us again of the forgiveness of our sins that he won for us on the cross. It's this great self-sacrificing love of Jesus that motivates our responses of thanks and joy for all that God has done for us. The Apostle John continued in 1 John chapter 4. Dear friends, since God so loved us, loved us in this way by sending his own son to save us, we also ought to love one another. Our power for living for God and following the commands that he gives for us in our lives comes from his love for us. Without his love, we would be totally lost in our sins, condemned to eternal punishment because of our sins. But with God's love, through the forgiveness of sins that Jesus has won for us, we are washed free of all of our sins. and We are restored to live a new and holy life before God. We love because he first loved us. And God's love also empowers us to love others with a loving, humble, servant attitude. And so we think of the gospel reading that we heard this morning, where Jesus emphasized that humble service out of love, not in order to try to get something in return from the person that we are helping out, but simply just to, to give something to others out of thanks for all that God has given to us. In the gospel reading, Jesus says, When you make a dinner or a supper, do not invite your friends or your brothers or your relatives or rich neighbors so that perhaps they may also return the favor and pay you back. But when you make a feast, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, the blind, and you will be blessed because they cannot repay you. Certainly you will be repaid in the resurrection of the righteous. Jesus' own servant heart, which led him to die on the cross, empowers us to love with that same kind of selflessness and humility with which he loved us and all people of the world. And any way in which we serve other people, God tells us is also a service of love to him. Jesus said in Matthew 25, Whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers of mine, you did for me. And so the writer to the Hebrews tells us that our whole lives, everything that we do, all of our daily activities, our, our job, going to school, all of our interactions with other people in our day-to-day -day lives, 
all of that is done as a living sacrifice of praise to God, giving thanks to God for everything that he has done for us to forgive our sins, to give us eternal life, to give us salvation. Our reading says, Through Jesus, therefore, let us constantly offer to God a sacrifice of praise that is the fruit of lips that confess his name. The love of Jesus, our Savior, who is the same yesterday and today and forever, empowers us to carry out his will. Because of God's love for us, we can keep on loving each other as brothers and sisters. Because of God's love, we can remember to show kindness and love to strangers and to those who are in prison or mistreated. Even if we don't personally know anyone who is in prison or mistreated, we can pray to God that all such people would be blessed and comforted by him and that God would reveal to them his saving love through Jesus. And we can also pray to God that God would give us opportunity to show that love of his to people in those situations, to bring his love and compassion and mercy to them. Because of God's love, we can resist sinful sexual thoughts and desires and actions so that we do show honor for God's institution of marriage and his gift of sexual intimacy that he has designed to be only between husband and wife in marriage. Because of God's love, we can resist greed. We can resist the love of money. And instead, as God says, we can be truly content with what he has given to us. We can do all of these things because God loved us so much that he sent his own son to die for us. And he loves us still. And he promises to be with us through all the trials and temptations of life. He says to us, I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. So where does the power for Christian living come from? Well, we've seen that on our own, we are powerless. But God's love empowers us. So let's cling to that love of God for us. Let's remember the sacrifice of Jesus for us on the cross. Let's firmly trust in Jesus' promise that he will never leave us. And let's pray that his love for us expresses itself in everything that we think and say and do in our lives, so that our whole lives may be a sacrifice of praise and thanks to God, holy and pleasing in his sight. Amen.